All right, guys. So for the first video here, um, I'm going to open up my IDE. Uh, I use a program called PyCharm. Let me even do, do, do. Let's open up a new window here. Let's swing over to PyCharm. So JetBrains is the company. Just want to show you this real quick. Um, there is two different versions. If I go to PyCharm, it is an IDE for professionals, of course, but also for those learning. If I go to download now, it's going to take me to two different areas, uh, one for professional, one for community. Community is free. Uh, by all means, if you're just starting out, get the free version. Um, I have the professional, which you pay, I think it's about $19 a month for, uh, but it has way more function, uh, functionality that you'll need as you grow as well. But when you're just starting out, you absolutely do not. And of course, they have it for Windows, Macs, and, and uh, Linux. Now, really quick note, I've done, I've used Python on all three of those operating systems. Um, and I've, I'm back to Windows. Windows is uh, even utilizing modules and different libraries uh, for artificial intelligence and deep learning. Windows is still uh, the most stable, the easiest, and the most user-friendly, especially when we start going into GPUs and utilizing the GPU to do the, the data analysis because it's just it's way, way too intensive on the CPU. Um, so if you're ever having a question on which one you should go with, I say stick with Windows if you're in it. If not, it's worth hopping over to. Um, I know a huge environment is on Linux, uh, and I get it, I've tried it, it has this thing, but there's still there's too many quirks, especially when you start utilizing GPUs, because the, the drivers are not necessarily there, and then when you start getting into high-performance computing and parallelization and so forth, it just it, it falls apart. So your best bet is still going to be Windows. Um, so by all means, if you have any questions about PyCharm, how to download it, so forth, search it on YouTube. They have their own install videos, which I think are phenomenal. Um, but once you get it going... You can up, open up that bad boy, and it will, let me actually show you how it would open, because mine's already there. So I'm going to open up PyCharm. Now this is not, you might see other places, other tutorials, they use um, the IDLE the, and the Python shell to run everything, which is cool, but if you're ever going to actually work in a job utilizing Python, you're going to find yourself going over to these uh, developer environments um, and using virtuals and so forth, which we'll get into down the road, way more than you will ever in the IDLE and the, and the shell. So I figure instead of making that conversion later, might as well use it now. And also PyCharm and some of these other IDEs have a debugger function, which is massive when you're trying to understand what the heck the computer's doing and how it's functioning. So I just, really quick, I want to see why that is... Use soft wraps. That's better. I don't know if you can notice, but my words were going off the screen, so I just wanted to throw that little arrow there. Soft wraps, so that I could I could see what's going on. So um, what we have here is is Python, and the color coding is depending on. Um, I've said that up personally, but when you first start Python, your colors will be different. Um, if if anybody wants this kind of a setup, let me know. I can throw you the settings. Uh, I think it's a jar file, but the the colors are there to give you an indication as to. Um, what each piece is. So as an example, I have functions. Whenever I'm using a function of Python, it's going to be blue. Uh, my parentheses, my equal sign, a lot of my other um, binders are going to be orange, and then you can see everything else that's there is, is the color that it is. I, I keep it clean. I don't like having five, six, seven, eight, nine different colors on the screen. It drives me nuts. Um, so all I want you to do for this first lesson is copy the code I'm going to try to put the code underneath in the description. If it's not there, then go to cupofcode01.com and grab the code from the site there. So then you can just pop that .py file into your IDE and uh, copy along, learn to break it, learn to copy it, um, but actually type it out. The, the, the physical typing out is what's going to create the muscle memory for coding more than anything else. This is why uh, you could read something 100 times, but if you write it 10 times, the brain's going to have much better recall for that particular information because you're creating a muscle memory component to it, way more than just reading something or copying what I'm doing. Copy what I'm doing, but actually do the physical printing. Uh, have it where you, even if you print it out and then copy the damn thing, but it's important that you actually do the typing. But I don't want you just to copy the typing as I type it because then you're focusing on what I'm writing and not getting the context of what's going on and also then the time to learn how to break it and fix it. So really quick, the primary focus of this is to under, is to read the code as the computer reads it. And the way that we can do that 
is I'm going to set up here in the first line a breakpoint. So I just made that whole line red, uh, which is not a problem. And what I'm going to do is I want to run, and I want to run, uh, this is example, I'm on one. This is showing me two, see? Da, da, da. I want to go to example one, otherwise the interpreter would have been using the wrong file. So now I got debug ex1, perfect. Now in the but you can see the whole bottom of the screen here changed. I think I bring that up a little bit more, and you guys can still see it. Yes, uh, I'm going to go over here to console, and I'm going to come back up here. I'm going to hit F8. Now what I did, you can see now the blue line is telling me where the next line that it's going to execute, but I want you to see what happened was. Up on the top there, it's first very line, it says print, and then I have quotations, and then I have an exclamation point. Now it can be a single, a double, or a triple, we'll get into those, as long as you're consistent. Whatever you start the string with, you have to end the string with, so you can see those are the same there. But I'm telling the Python program I want you to print on the screen. Since this is a string in quotes and tied to the print function, Python knows to print, and you'll notice now these are double, which is very different than the single, and that's there too, so that I can actually see it when I, when I print it out. Uh, on the screen. So you can see down here on the bottom here, it did exactly that. It printed that on the console. So that's that's a program essentially. It, uh, it, it printed out the function of exactly what I wrote within the string. On the next line, which I executed, it says x equals 9. And then here in green, which I might change that to just like pink or something so it just really stands out. Um, this is now the computer created, as I'm debugging it, it created variable x with a value of 9. And now let's see what happens when I execute the next line. So right now it's on line number three. So I'm going to go step into my code once again. Now look at that. Next to the x equals 15, nothing happened. But if you go to the x equals 9, row number two, x is now 15. So the computer first created a variable x and put it in as 9. It assigned it as 9. That's the single equal sign as assignment. And then it created the assignment of 15. So now it's going to print x. So if you look down at the bottom here, I'm pointing to my screen. You can't see that, can you? So if you look down here, when I execute, it's going to print X. And it printed 15. It did not print 9. Because again, as you saw how it was executing, we changed the variable assignment from X to 9 to X equals 15. And it was nice to see that in the coding there. So of course we have 15. I'm going to step into the code again. And it printed out 17. Because here I'm doing a mathematical function. I'm telling the computer in line 5, print X plus 2. And X was 15, so plus 2 is 17. So now we have print X and the star star is to the power of so down below I can see it printed out 225 and uh, no Python's not just a really good calculator but it's a good way to start learning some of the mathematical operations that are just memorizing them and then I have um, X divided by 2 we get 7.5 and then on line number 8 I have this X backslash backslash 2 now what that is it's very similar to line 7 look at 7 and 8 and look what happens when I execute them so coming down here below I have 7.5 and 7 so x divided by 2 is going to give me the 7.5 because the x was 15. But then the x backslash backslash 2 is give me the whole number of the division. So whatever the remainder is, screw it. I don't want it. Um, and that is a similar somewhat thought process to the modulo. So by doing a backslash backslash, we're getting the whole number. Um, and if we were doing a modulus, we'd be getting the, the remainder of that division. Uh, going forward, now I'm changing x is equal to... Now this is a string, and I know it's a string. One, it has quotes. Also, it's white on my ID, uh, LE. But, uh, I'm sorry, my IDE. But X is now equal to 2, T-W-O. And so if you look up to the top of the screen here, i got to stop pointing at the screen. You can't see it. I just executed line 10, and up here at line 2, variable X in the computer now changed its, assi its assignment to the string 2. And I'm going to step through the code again. And now we created a new variable y, and it's equal to 3. Now I'm going to print x plus y. So we're going to look at the bottom here, and what happens? 2, 3. So it literally printed x, 2, plus y, 3. Now it didn't print 5, because these are strings. These are not digits. So Python at least can tell the difference between there. You'll also notice that there's no space between 2 and 3, and that's because we did not program in a space between the two. Uh, if I went here and I put a space on 2, and then we ran it, then we would have that space within the code. But let's get going. We're going to run through. So now I'm on, I had a, I created a new variable. These variables can be whatever you want them to be named. You just cannot start them with a number. 
So it's always best to uh, have, a, have a different coding style, but Python does have some rules about how you can name variables. You also can't use a function as a variable name because Python's gonna see it as a function. But here I have uh, line one equals, and I put a string here. So of course the computer correspondingly creates a new variable, line one, and it put the string in that place. I will step through the code again, and I would expect the same thing. Sure enough, it created a variable, line two, and finish the line here. Now I'm going to do line three. I'm going to add line one plus line two. And we should think we would get a similar thing to the print x plus y up above. And sure enough, we do. Line three is, I will start the line here, dot, dot, dot. And now there's a space here. And finish the line here. Now that space came, if you notice up here, I have a space between the quote and the first letter. And we also have a space between the end of that line and the quote. So by putting the space inside your string, you'll get that space on the execution of your code. Now, you may be saying, well, what the hell? It's up here, but it didn't print out anything down here. And that's because I didn't put print. I didn't tell Python I wanted to print it to the console to the, as an output to the screen. I want this all stored internally as so far. But now what do we have on our line number 19? We have print line three. So if I'm gonna run that, step into the code and in the console, now we, steal, now we see our line three. And line 20, if I step into the code, it printed it twice because all I did was I uh, concatenated the two lines together by addition. Again, no spaces between them because the coding in the beginning of the sentence or the end of it did not have spaces. And then finally, line number 22, I'm going to step into the code, print this is a test. So, it looks like it's falling over there. Um, <clears throat> and on the bottom here, printed this is a test. I just wanted you to notice on this last line, the quotation pieces. So I have single quotes in the front and the back. So that tells Python that this is a string. So what I'm gonna do is if I take out those double quotes and I run the code, you'll see now on the bottom, the quotes are gone. We can actually get rid of this now, I'm not stepping through anymore. And if I want the quotes to show up, I have to make them different than when the quotes that hold my string. So now I will get the quotes on this is a test. And uh, just up above over here, I put that space back into two. So now you'll see there is a space between two and three when I print it out x plus y. So this is not just doing print hello world. Um, this is gonna go much faster as each lesson goes on. Um, they will get longer as well. But again, this is lesson number one and primarily learning about the print function, doing some, some mathematical operations, learning about variable assignment. So go through some of this stuff. Um, play with the code. See if you can break it somehow. Take out, uh, you know, an ending there, and you'll notice immediately on my, on my environment, I have a red circle up here and all these red lines, because now this thing's already telling me you're going to get errors at the wazoo. So sure enough, if I run it, it's, and it's telling me I got a syntax error, invalid syntax, and it's telling me where, line number six, it's telling me that it wants to print XS2. That's where it got stuck. It, got, it couldn't get here, which means if it's telling me line six, this is normal. It means it got stuck usually on the line before. Little, little nuance of, of some of these environments. So I go to the line before, and sure enough, what am I doing? I'm missing that parenthesis there. So once I now run it, now I'm good to go. Um, and I'll show you another time this file. This is example1.py. I could run this in uh, my own console here if I wanted to. You know what, I'll just do it now. I'll show you real quick. So I wanna make sure we're in there, we are. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm going, you might hear the dog in the background. Uh, do, 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 where do I have all this stuff? I'm in PyCharm projects. So I'm gonna go to exercise one. I'm gonna go to properties and I'm gonna take this this is its location, so first I have to cd into that location, and that is change directory. So now I'm, I'm in the directory of where that file is located, and it is ex1 is the name of it. So I'm going to tell my environment here I want to use Python to run ex1.py, and then when I run it, sure enough, we have everything in place exactly as we did down here in the console. Um, <clears throat> running it out just bam, 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 line for line. Now, most code's not going to always run from beginning to end just automatically. It depends on how we initialize the files. It depends on if there's inputs uh, and, and also depending on if those inputs are going to have a direct impact on the outputs. But 
I wanted you to see you can run the program even through uh, command prompt. There's a bunch of different ways we're going to do it. We're going to be creating some really cool stuff here. We're going to be utilizing Python um, to create games. We're going to be using Python to uh, for Minecraft. Um, Python to control your coffee maker. Python to mess with your Alexa if you have it, or the Google Home if you have it, creating an app for this. So it's all using Python. Uh, and another big area of mine is finance. So using Python to... Uh, as your portfolio manager, using Python if you're doing day trading, how to get live feeds from from the from the exchanges, and how to use artificial intelligence to um, to to parse that data and find patterns that may exist there that you would never see as a human, just because it's too fast and it's too much data. Um, and also, it's nice to also use some of this to go backwards and see that certain uh, theories or thoughts you might have had about investing are not right uh, especially when you can back test using artificial intelligence to do forward testing on it um, and find statistical significance and so forth and find that certain things looked a certain way but they ain't that way uh, so it's a phenomenal phenomenal uh, skill to have it's programming in general is akin to a superpower because once you learn how to program you can you can do anything um, anything you need to create you can create uh, and it's just a matter of, of knowing the knowledge base and more important than memorizing like, aspects of the code and the function so forth. You'll learn those as you go along. But more important than that is learning how to read the code, understanding, at least for me in the beginning it was, understanding what the hell, what I'm typing in, what is that telling the computer? How is the computer seeing and interpreting this? And there was a, I think it's pythontutor.com or .org, I'm not sure. They have a similar function to this. It was essentially like a debugger, showing you how it was uh, parsing uh, variable inputs and assignments and so forth. And it was, it was nice, but I find line by line to be a lot cleaner because then I can go forwards and backwards, step in my code, step out of my code. Uh, even if I import other modules, I can step through those modules as well to really understand what's going on and what's tripping up um, a particular program. But for video one, let's cut it short. Um, again, copy this, learn to break it, learn to fix it, and uh, just go to the next video then. Don't get stuck on getting 100% on everything. Go to the next video. Keep building and building and building. Don't strive for 100% on everything. Get to 85, get to 90, go to the next step because those other pieces will be filled. Have a great day, guys.